a friend of mine once said that he's a Catholic, he's a Catholic and he said that we get the human nature bit really right. We don't do the grace bit, but we do the human nature bit. Um, and I think what he means is, and I, uh, to be honest, I think this is the case in comparison to any religious school. We're really good at the human nature bit because we get how children can be naughty. <laughs> so, um, I would say that m many schools need to be more strict. I mean, obviously, I think that because, well, I believe in strictness. <laughs> so, and I, and the reason why we believe in strictness is because uh, we get uh, the the point about children being naughty, you know, and people do disagree with me. About Welcome to Reenchanting, the podcast from Seen and Unseen. You can find us at the website seenandunseen.com. I am Justin Briley. And I am Belle Tindall. And if you're watching on video, do make sure to like and subscribe. If you're listening via podcast, do rate and review the show. We are just a fledgling podcast and it does help others to discover Reenchanting. We have as our guest today, speaking with us, Catherine Beerelsing. So just to introduce you a second, Catherine. So you are the founder of Michaela Community School in Brent. You have been dubbed, I think it was by ITV, was it? Britain's strictest headmistress. Um, and her no-nonsense approach to education has won her both very avid fans and some quite loud critics as well. But the school that she leads in inner city London has proven itself with outstanding results since it was founded in 2014. Now, Catherine isn't a Christian, but she has spoken about the way she believes Christianity has shaped our culture. And we're going to be talking about the education system, the good and the bad, and whether it can be re-enchanted with a Christian vision of flourishing. So welcome along. Thank you for having me. So we, um, we always ease people in. So usually we record this podcast on the rooftop of Lambeth Palace Library. And because we do so, we sort of think... A great place to start our conversation is by asking sort of what books are on your bedside table at the moment what are you enjoying reading right now well i'll tell you what's on my on my desk <laughs> uh, um, robert condicio's how the other half learns now i've already read this i read this a few years ago mm -hmm. but got him coming in next week it's he writes about uh, a year that he spent in uh success academy which is a charter school in new york uh which does extraordinary things for inner city kids there. Thomas mm. Sowell has al also written a book called Charter Schools and Their Enemies, which again is all about Success Academy in New York because they do such a, an extraordinary job in terms of the results, in terms of the kinds of children that they, they become. And so I'm really excited to have Robert Pondicio in next week. He's visiting, he's doing a research ed um, event on Saturday in Bournemouth. And so he's coming to see us on Wednesday. I've also got an it's all American here today. I can I promise you I also have British books <laughs> only. I've also got Woke Racism, which I recently read by John McWhorter, who is an African American. And he uh this is I highly recommend this book. It really explains how the anti racist position is really just pretty racist. <laughs> and he, he just does a really good job of breaking that down and, and making sense for people with you know, around that idea. So those are the two books here. Oh. Wow. Well, you, you've never been afraid of kind of speaking out on these kinds of issues. And, and we'll probably get to some of them as we as we okay, get on. This is also here. Oh, yes. Me by Roger Morehouse, who's a historian. He came to visit our kids a week or two ago um, and he uh, he gave me one of his books as, as a gift, you know. But he just came to talk to them about uh, communism and some his some history stuff. So. Wow. Great. Great. <laughs> Look, yeah, as as Bell said, you have been dubbed Britain's strictest headmistress. Um, wh where did you get that title from, and and what does it tell us about your educational philosophy at uh, the Michaela School? Yeah, well, originally, actually, it was the Sunday Times. Sean Griffiths um, wrote an article about us years ago, and I think we were called the strictest. I was the strictest teacher, maybe mm -hmm. not headmistress. Mm. Anyway, that has gone on for years since then. But ITV did this documentary about us last year and they called it the strictest headmistress in Britain. Um, and, well, we are very strict. <laughs> um, and when I say we're very strict, you know, people think, oh, that means we're mean to children. I would say that actually uh, being strict with children is just holding them to high standards and loving them enough in order to do so. 
And when mm. children understand that you love them, they like the strictness because it means they can really thrive, you know, in terms of um, their uh, academic um, uh, you know, achievements, but also developing a, a moral core to them and becoming good people. So, you know, we have silent corridors. They're not allowed to speak in the corridors. Um, if they were, they walk in single file uh, very quickly to their lessons. They, if they were to turn around in a lesson or to, uh, you know, try and talk to another child, they would immediately get a detention, that, that kind of thing. And so what it means is kids never do that stuff. You know, <laughs> that's, it means that within a minute we do our transitions and they're in their lessons really quickly. And it means that when you've got children who you're trying to catch up to their reading age because they're 11 years old, but they actually read like a 70-year-old, they are able to catch up because they have more time in their lessons. Their lessons aren't disrupted. People don't like uh, strictness, but it's the way in which you can support the most disadvantaged children. And mm. and just in a sense, that why is that so countercultural? Um, what was your experience before you founded Michaela School? Well, I, I'd say that, you know, schools can be quite chaotic. I mean, obviously, it depends on your intake. If you've got a more selective intake, you won't have as much chaos. I've always worked in the inner city with more challenging intakes, so I've seen probably the worst of behavior. Um, but it, even in the schools where the behavior isn't terrible and, you know, I mean, I would say that there's poor behavior everywhere. You know, I go to see private schools and I'm shocked by some of the behavior. Um, but what I mean by some of the behavior, the way that they're just rude to everybody, rude to their teachers, um, uh, the way that they're sloppy and lazy and can't be bothered and they're not engaging with their learning. It, you know, the, the, the fact that our standards are just, well, as long as you don't hit your teacher, it's okay. No, I expect more than that. I want hands up when, the, when Christians are being asked. I want them to, to love their learning and be interested in school. And that can only happen if you have a culture that is like that because the children will just, will they, they will adapt to their culture. And um, I think that people generally have low standards. I don't just mean teachers. I mean, everybody, all of us in society. And we don't realize just what kids can do. Um, and so then I say to people, come and visit our school. Come and see what the kids can do. Because unless you see it, you don't really know what I'm talking about. Because you won't really see this elsewhere. That's the thing. You just won't. So then you just think, I'm, I'm just speaking in a vacuum. Because people don't really understand what I mean. And they don't know what's possible. Mm. And it's... Am I right in saying you don't have a selective process? You get your stu your pupils through the council just like any other free Definitely. school. And not only do we get our kids through the council just like any other school, but we're in the inner city. Mm. So we've got a far more challenging intake than you would find in many, many schools. Mm. So do you find, because this is quite a specific approach to education or, you know, maybe when, like you say, because I haven't seen it, sort of it feels quite countercultural. So does children are so individual do you find that it has the same results across the board or does it work better for some personality types well i'd say it works best with the children who come from more disadvantaged backgrounds right so the ones who ha have special needs the ones who come from broken homes the ones who come mm. from more you know poorer families the ones that are the most vulnerable because in a normal classroom or in a normal school if you think about it, who are the kids who end up spinning out of control? The ones who come with various issues. They come from difficult family background. They have special needs. They aren't, you know, they're, they're more in the bottom set rather than the top set. You know, those are the kids who end up falling off the wagon. Of mm -hmm. course, the stricter you are, the more kids you keep on that wagon. <laughs> so, you know, your top set kids who have very supportive families, who are, you know, have everything going for them, they'll be okay wherever they are. And it doesn't matter. I'm not, I'm not, and that's, mm. and that's great. And we've got kids like that and they're also fine, but those aren't the ones I'm really worried about. It's all the other ones whose lives end up being far less than they could be because they're not in an environment which expects more of them. They're mm. not in a culture that they can adapt to, which just makes them work hard and makes them turn up on time and makes them engage in lessons because behavior isn't just about compliance. It's about engagement. It's about enjoyment. Yeah. And um, that happens when the culture in the school is one of joy of learning, love, uh, high standards, and so on. You know, when you say children aren't all the same, you know, the thing is kids are kids. So it doesn't really matter what race they are, how poor or rich they are. It doesn't matter what nationality they are. <laughs> 
you know, and when I say that, you know, we could be in France or in, you know, Argentina or wherever, it doesn't matter. Kids are kids. <laughs> no. mm-hmm. and, and all of this, you know, ha- raising your standards for them. Any parent knows this. If, if you raise your standards for the child, they will meet you there. If you lower your standards, they'll meet you there. It's just the way that it works. Mm. You recently appeared and you've been regularly on some fairly large platforms in recent years, Catherine. You appeared at the National Conservatism Conference to talk about education. Um, and you shared a tweet afterwards. Someone accused you of being a fascist, uh, perhaps just for appearing there. I don't know. But you responded that you were actually there to critique both the progressive left and, and the right as well. You gave them a bit of a ticking off, actually, in your in your talk. I what did. did you actually say? And where do these accusations of fascism come from? Well, I don't know. I really can't explain uh, the, the lunacy of some of these comments. Um, and when I say to them, what did I say that was fascist? They obviously are un- unable to respond. Um, I think maybe they're just angry that I went to that conference at all. Some people just say things like, you shouldn't go there. These people are evil. And I very much stand against that. I mean, I don't know all the various speakers at the conference. I didn't hear them. It was a three-day conference. I was only there for half a day. I I don't know. And I, I, I sort of don't care. I mean, I, I was invited to go to a conference. And so I went and I spoke to them and I knew that there would be loads of conservatives there. So I took the opportunity to really critique those conservatives and to tell them that I thought that lots of them were hypocritical. Essentially. What, what, what did you say? I, why were you telling them? Because you are yourself a conservative with a small C, you say, Catherine. Yep. What, why, why were you critiquing them for their conservative values? Yeah, I wasn't critiquing them for their values. I was critiquing them for uh, not standing up for their values. So, and also for not understanding the role that schools play in shaping culture in a society. So my biggest bugbear, I said to them, for instance, you all don't think very much of us teachers. So I think a lot of those people, they, uh, they think to themselves, oh, teachers, bunch of lefties. Uh, I know what I'll do. I'll take my child out of the state sector. I'll put him in the private sector and then it'll all be fine. Um, and they don't understand that private schools are just as lefty and if not more woke than uh, than the state sector. And the reason why they're more woke is that um, if the, the, the more privileged the space, the more awkward people feel about their privilege, the more woke they are. And so they are mistaken to assume that state schools are really woke and that private schools are not. That's just not true. And so I was pointing that out to them. I was also pointing out the fact that uh, we teachers are bright and clever and capable and stop insulting us and saying that we don't know what we're doing. And also, all we're if you want to accuse us of being woke, well, we're just as woke as society is. You know, so conservatives go around saying, oh, woke teachers, woke schools, etc. Yeah, just like the rest of society. We are just imparting knowledge that we've picked up from living in society. So you can't just blame us, you know, so that was one thing I was saying. And then, mm. um, yeah, I was just pointing out the hypocrisy. I was pointing out the importance of schools. Oh, and then I was also saying, speak up. So I know there are lots of people out there, small C conservative and also not even, just people in the center who feel very uncomfortable about saying what they think. And that's because they think they'll lose their jobs, they'll lose their friends, they will essentially be canceled. Now, of course, a lot of these people who call me a fascist, they deny that there's such a thing as cancel culture. They deny that there's such a thing as wokeism, in fact. Um, But the fact is, these things are all true and real. And the reason why, uh, you know, the audience, I mean, it was fascinating, really, because I was criticizing them in in a big way. And yet they gave me a standing ovation, you know, (laughs) and they laughed it off. And afterwards, you know, a number of people came to me and said, I was sinking into my chair as you were speaking, or I feel properly told off. I felt bad when you were telling me what you were saying. But the thing is, Catherine, you're, you're right. And I have to admit it. And, you know, I need to change my ways. And it was amazing. The number of people, some woman, I was walking along the street, she stopped off her bike and she said, I'm going to speak out now. I'm going to do, I'm going to live my life differently. You know, people were really quite inspired mm. to try and do things differently. And I have a lot of respect for those people because I went in there and I wasn't nice. And I said what I thought and they, I didn't know what was going to happen. I mean, they could have chased me out of there with pitchforks, you know, I, I was a little bit nervous because I thought, oh my goodness, I'm going in here and saying stuff I shouldn't say. But they didn't do that. They were really open to the criticism. 
which was really fascinating because then when you compare that to how the left responded upon hearing this in, and the thing is, I wasn't even accusing the left. I mean, I, I wasn't being critical of the left at all. Um, and yet they went insane and started posting uh, videos of Hitler's speeches and saying that my speech reminded them of Hitler, um, that I was a fascist, uh, that, you know, I mean, they went crazy. And then we're talking hundreds, if not thousands of people. I mean, like, I don't know, maybe thousands too many, but I mean, I saw a lot of comments. I mean, it was crazy. Mm. And yet the conservative people who were the ones I was telling off were really open-minded and took the criticism. So, mm. you know, it it really did for me, it really opened my mind when I compared the two groups, you know? Could that be though? So I watched, I watched it on YouTube last night. Could that be that you were telling the right off, sure, but what you were actually telling them was that they were too left. They were hypocrites because actually they would send in their children to schools which you would put on the left. You would say a work. So actually what you were doing is sort of giving a double punch to the left. Is that why they got angry, well, angrier? Well, no, but I was saying, I was saying that the private sector was as well if not more woke than mm. the left. That's all I'm saying. I'm just, I'm, I, I'm pointing out, uh, uh, you know, just it's just a point. If you, mm. if you if you have a problem with woke schools, then why don't you send your children to less woke schools? I and mean, that was my point. Because you could send your children to my school, but you don't do that. <laughs> and there are other schools, as I made very clear in my speech, that I'm, we're not the only school that's not woke. There are other schools that aren't woke, but if they're state, you're not going to send them there. <laughs> You want to send your children, not just to private schools, but the most prestigious private schools. And I was saying that the more prestigious the private school, the more woke it likely is. That's not a, that's not a rule, but that's just a general trend. The closer it is to London, the more prestigious it is, the more woke it's going to be. And, you know, that's always the case. I'm sure you'll find a prestigious school in London that isn't very woke, but uh, you, you can't, it, it's not right to then make this decision of, oh, well, it's okay. I'll just send them there. When in fact, you're just, you you are participating in this woke stuff and you're pretending that you're not because because you're, you're, you're actually interested in your status. That's all you're interested in. And you want to be able to tell your friends, my son goes to Eton, you know, my son goes to Harrow, as opposed to actually caring about what they're being taught in schools. Well, we'll, we'll maybe come to this the whole question of woke a bit later on because I'd be, be interested to kind of dig into exactly why you feel... Uh that particular way of, you know, yeah. looking at the world is affecting young people and their education and everything else. Yeah. I mean, perhaps we could maybe turn a little bit, though, to to your own sort of background here. Um, I mean, it was interesting because I, I also watched your, your speech and and at the end you you kind of roused the audience with a bit of Russell Crowe from Gladiator and and you had the, that, that famous line of his, what you do in life echoes in eternity, which has a sort of spiritual ring to it. Uh, do, do you kind of have any kind of, spiritual sense yourself Catherine as as an individual or, or was that just a more of a re rhetorical line I suppose it's rhetorical although I do believe that I mean echoes in eternity yeah it is rhetor rhetorical I do think that when we die we die um but I do think you want to live a life that's worth living and you want to be able to get to 85 when you're lying on your deathbed and and look back at your life and think I contributed I did something to make the world into a better place and that was partly what I was saying in my speech, which was that if you spend your life actually being interested in status, um, then you're not going to be able to look back and think I contributed. If you never actually say what you think out loud because you're so terrified of the consequences that you'll get cancelled, then you'll never be true to yourself. So th that, that yeah, that was what I was yeah, That was the, the, the sense. I mean, you obviously come from a Christian background. Your parents, I think, have both committed Christians. Tell us about sort of why that didn't stick for you, as it were. Um, well, my mother is a very committed Christian. My father, I mean, he's, you know, I suppose he would call himself a Christian, but my mother is a born again Christian. You know, mm. she's quite serious. You know, she's Jamaican. Um, uh, well, I just, I don't believe in God. <laughs> I, don't <wanna, laughs> I, you know, I don't believe, you know, I just don't, I, I'm agnostic. I wouldn't say I was atheist. Mm. Maybe there is a God. Uh, I don't know. I sort of don't know, so I'm not willing to make that decision. Um, so I just sort of sit on the fence. What, what what would you say you have brought through, sort of helpfully or positively from that Christian upbringing, though, into your adult life, if if anything? Uh, well, I think um, you know the kind of order and structure, uh, the, the 
turning up on time, having to go to Sunday school on a Sunday, you know, all that sort of stuff. Um, you know, it, it gives you a, you know, whatever the religion is, I don't think it matters if it's Christianity or Islam or Hinduism and whatever, you know, the idea that you're part of something bigger than yourself and it makes you humble and mm -hmm. makes you understand your kind of place in the world and then having various rituals that you would follow those rituals, I think, are really important. So we uh, imitate rituals. You know, the kids the kids stand for me at assembly, for instance. That's um, people think, oh, she's got such a big head. But it has nothing to do with that. It's about having a ritual. I sort of play a role as headmistress and they play their role as children. Um, and I think all religions give uh, children that um, security and understanding of where they are in the world and an expectation on how to be, uh, on, on how to behave which I think is really helpful for children growing up. Mm. And of course, I suppose historically, rather than the state, edu the main education provider was the church. Um, do you, so therefore, do you, would you say that there's a benefit to having sort of religious values, you know, even church schools, is there a benefit to that being embedded in the education system? Uh, um, oh, I mean, I don't have anything against uh, different religious schools I mean you know if people want to be in a particular religious school because that's their religion and that's very important to them then they ought to um, mm -hmm. I do think that we need lots of secular schools mm -hmm. uh, I suppose my one worry about um, religious schools if and this isn't the case now because religious schools are required to take in uh, children from other faiths Yeah, if you only have one faith in that school then I suppose overall across the country, I, I think that's quite divisive. Mm -hmm. uh, so I like our secular school because all of the children have different faiths. Some are non-faith, but they all are, are friends with each other. They all, mm -hmm. um, you know, they, they all like each other. They, they, and, and whether whatever race you are, whatever faith you are, doesn't matter at our school because they are all the friendships, uh, you know, are across faiths and are across race. Yeah. And yeah, it's, I think... It's, you posted and tweeted rather an article by Tom Holland a little while ago and you said with it I'm not a Christian but people often say Michaela is such a Christian school it's because Christianity is so ingrained in our culture and values that we assume it is common sense um can you talk us through a little bit of why people say Michaela is such a Christian school if that's the case or what are they picking up on there well you know it's funny because of course everybody who comes with whatever religion they have, they always say that it's like, you know, so Muslims will say that it's an Islamic school. Uh, Hindus will say it's a Hindu school. Oh, okay. One of my old teachers who was, um, who was a Hindu, he did a whole CPD training session with the staff where he said, you think it's Christian? Well, it's not, it's obviously Hindu. And then he went through all the tenets of Hinduism and it was funny. I thought, isn't this funny? It's all matching, you know, mm. Because I don't know much about Hinduism. I know more about Christianity, obviously, because I, I, I was brought up in the church. And it was weird because I was listening to him thinking, yeah, I suppose it could be a Hindu school. I mean, look, in terms of uh, the Christian ideas, you know, uh, the idea of, um, uh, uh, well, loving your neighbor, uh, uh, you know, that that whole sense of, like I just said, across faiths, across yeah. race, and so on, that's very much in the school. Uh, the idea of... Uh, uh, putting others before yourself that's very much a christian idea um um you know a, a friend of mine once said that who's a cat he's a catholic and he said that we get the human nature bit really right we don't do the grace bit but we do the human nature bit um and i think what he means is and i uh, to be honest i think this is the case in comparison to any religious school we're really good at the human nature bit because we get how children can be naughty <laughs> so, um and because of that and so you know you will with, with the whole original sin point that i made we get that and because we get that and we then deal with it so we're very strict as a result and we teach the children morality um we in that sense christians might look and go oh yeah you know that's a really christian school i think sometimes in christian schools they don't necessarily get the human nature bit right so because they don't get, and I wouldn't just say that for Christian schools, I'd say that for any faith school, because I would say that m many schools need to be more strict. I mean, obviously, I think that because, well, I believe in strictness. Uh, 
So, and I, and the reason why we believe in strictness is because uh, we get uh, the, the point about children being naughty, you know, and people do disagree with me about this. And they would say that children are inherently good. And I would say, well, I don't agree with that. I mean, I want to come back to this this point. Not everyone listening maybe will will be aware of what you referenced there. This this tweet you made about original sin it caused quite a stir on Twitter a little while ago. Uh, this is what you wrote um, in response to someone else talking about it. You said exactly original sin. Children need to be taught right from wrong and then habituated into choosing good or evil. That sparked a lot of sort of debate and controversy and theological questions and so on. Now, in a sense, as you said, you're, you're not a Christian. So you are using original sin as, as I suppose, a placeholder for an idea. So what, what, what were you trying to express in that? Yeah, it's like I talk about echoes in eternity. I mean, it's the same thing. I'm just making references <laughs> that, 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 that we all are aware of. You know, we, we understand when I say echoes in eternity. I just mean it's really important, you know, mm -hmm. um, when I say original sin, I don't I'm not I'm all I'm saying is, is that children, it, it's wrong to think that if you just leave a child and don't instill a sense of right and wrong in him, that he will just figure it out on his own. He won't. If you put two toddlers with one toy next to each other, they will attack each other in order to get the toy. You know, and so and they'll keep attacking each other because they don't understand when they're little. And you've got to teach them right from wrong. Um, you need to instill a moral core in them. And when you teach it to them, you can't just say it once. And this is the point about the tweet. You need to habituate it over years with practice. Um, so that's why when you teach a child to say please and thank you, you give him the chocolate and he grabs it. right? And you say, no, 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 no. Say please. And then he kind of says please with a bit of, a bit of annoyance. You give him the chocolate. The next time he tries to grab it, you say, what do you need to say? Please, right. And then eventually all of us right now know how to say please and thank you. But that's because somebody took the time when we were younger to keep their standards high for us and to teach us that stuff um, and to hab habituate it in ourselves. If, however, we have this idea in our heads that children really don't need that teaching of moral you know, fiber as well as habituating them in it, then children will grow up with uh without a sense of right and wrong and that that's what i mean about getting the human nature bit right we do that really really well so you would say that where some teachers would say um you need to draw what's already in the child sort of the goodness the talent you draw that out you would say no 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 children are blank canvases or actually no sort of more than that they lean towards sort of defiance and selfishness and it, you literally need to mold that out of them yeah definitely yeah and is it as, does it have to be as obvious? You know, kids, yeah. there's this lovely, I just love this little um, uh, video on Twitter. Some father posted it where his two little boys, one's about three or something, maybe one's about five, and they're sat at the table and he puts some sweets in front of them, two piles of sweets, and he says, Mummy and Daddy are going to pop out for a moment out of the room. You are not allowed to eat the sweets until we come back. And so he goes out, and the phone is there, you know, recording. And so he goes out of the room, and the boys, as soon as the door clicks, boys look at each other, and, and they smile, <laughs> and they immediately head for the sweets, and they put it in their mouths, and they start dancing. <laughs> it's so cute. And they're going like, and they're looking at each other, and they're grinning, and they're picking another one. And like, I mean, that's what kids do. It's what makes kids, they're just lovely. But the point is that unless you teach them right from wrong, they won't, they're, they're not going to learn. And eventually those boys will learn and the, the father will put the sweets in front of them and they won't touch them. But like, you know, of course they're going to do it if you haven't taught them and habituated them in, in, into that. Are effect. you saying though that our present education system does not take that approach of simply saying, okay, we have to teach these kids right from wrong that that it's somehow assumed they'll work it out for themselves and if they're not doing that then somehow that's just because they're a product of their situation or culture or circumstances so i'm not saying that about the whole system no but i do think that there are some people who think like that and i mean all those people who are outraged about my original sin tweet well there you go that those people definitely think what they think you know children are inherently good how can you say such a thing you know they got very angry so those people, definitely, they don't get what they should be doing with children. But that is not the case that that's everybody. Uh, there's a mix of, 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 of um, practice out there. 
I mean, not just with teachers, but with parents as well, because this is a parental thing too. Um, some parents know that they need to habituate their child into uh, doing good. Other parents don't. You know, it really, there's just, it's just a mixed bag. And when it comes to this idea, going back to what Bell said about the fact that we've sort of grown up in a broadly Christian context historically, one thing you said when referencing the fact that people think of the Michaela School as Christian because, well, of course, you know, we've all grown up with Christian values and virtues as the sort of the norm in culture anyway. Yeah. You you also said, but if many reject these values, what of the future? I mean, do you have any fears for what the future will look like in an increasingly post-Christian culture in that sense? Yeah, well, again, I would just say, look, all the religions out there are teaching people to behave well. Um, the problem with secularism is that if you don't believe in anything, right? If you don't have any values and you just say anything goes, then we are in trouble. So we are a secular school that does believe in something, right? Um, we have a very clear ethos and a very and very clear expectations of the children, and all of us in the school buy into that culture. Um, uh, where where I worry is that the kind of liberal way of being which is very much anything goes, you do as you like. Uh, and that's not just in school. I mean, that's everywhere. That's our society. Uh, I worry that too much of that, you can have a little bit of it, but too much of that will mean the disintegration of our, 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 our values as a country. Is that what you say? Can I quote your speech from uh, earlier this week for a sec. Is that what you mean then by when you said, if we don't get on top of the culture that schools are propagating, we will lose our country? Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's exactly it. Um, if you're, if it's anything goes, if it's, but I mean, it's more than that because some schools are, so what do we mean by wokeism? I mean, we can get, get onto that point. What do I mean by woke? So it used to be the case that, um, so People will put on Twitter and they'll say, oh, but wokeism is simply being aware of racism. Um, I think it's come to mean a lot more than that, actually. It originally started as that, and obviously we would have a problem with that. Um, but it's developed into... Uh, um, so it, what it, what's happened is it used to be the case that the left would be interested in Marxist ideas where the rich uh, you know, were oppressing the poor and the poor were sort of fighting back. That was the idea. And that was the that was the the hierarchy, rich and then moving down to poor. Nowadays, and this is the distinction between that left way of seeing things and now a woke way of seeing things, woke means they're no longer so interested in that hierarchy of rich to poor. They're interested in the hierarchy that exists now according to identity. And so woke being woke or being a leftist identitarian, it, uh, they're interchangeable. It's the same thing. And what do we mean by leftist and identita identitarian? It means it's somebody who really believes that identity is the way to see if the if those are the glasses that you see everyone through. So you look at me, you see a black woman. I look at you, and I see a white man and a white woman. You know, and that and it's not just race. It might also be um, uh, your sexuality. It might also be whether you're abled or disabled. It could be you know any number of things that often the kinds of things that people would say, well, this is what makes me into a victim. This is what, uh, this is my issue in life, that this is, this is how I, so every day I wake up and I'm a black woman and I have to see my life through that lens. And every day I'm hit by the fact that I'm a black woman. And I wouldn't deny the fact that there are, dis that there are differences in, in, in my experiences to mm. uh, white women's experiences that, um, I mean, I would actually argue that one of the reasons why I think everybody gets so angry with me is partly because I'm a black woman. And how dare I say these things because I'm meant to be grateful to the left and they're meant to own me. And how dare I think for myself? So I, I would argue very much this is an example of racism. But, you know, I, I'm not. But you notice I don't go on about it. I'm not. This isn't the thing that, oh, my goodness, I can't live because life is so hard for me. I don't really talk about it because I don't believe in um in wallowing in victimhood. And I certainly don't believe in um, in encouraging children to view themselves through the lens of identity and then in internalize that so that they feel it's very difficult to, 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 to get on in life. So most of our children are ethnic minority children, for instance. Um, I don't want them growing up thinking the establishment is white. 
uh, white people are evil. Um, life is going to be really hard for me because I'm not white. I want them seeing obstacles in front of them and being able to jump over those obstacles. And one of those obstacles, a big obstacle, would be the mentality that you carry with you. Because if the mentality is I'm an outsider, I cannot achieve because these people won't let me into their group, that is a real um, disadvantage in life. And I don't want my children carrying that disadvantage. I want them feeling like they do belong. That was one of the things I talked a lot about in the speech, the idea of belonging, belonging to one's country. Um, and if you have uh, ethnic minority children constantly being told that they don't belong, and they're being told this by people who think that they're really right on, no, you're not British, you're actually from you know, Nigeria, you're from Jamaica, you're from um, Ghana, and so on. If that's what they're being told all the time, then it's very difficult to succeed in that environment because mm. they are in Britain, and I think that they are just as British as any white British child, and we should all be encouraged to feel like we are part of our country so that we belong, and we don't. And I think we don't because often white people feel very guilty, and so they don't want to do that. And then I think the people who pay the price are the ethnic minority children. If I if I can push back a little bit on on this thing, Catherine, obviously you you feel that it's really important not to allow young people and kids to see themselves as victims, you know, of their circumstances or identity or whatever it is. And yet, you wouldn't deny surely that obviously there are structural injustices. There are things happening in their lives that put them at a disadvantage and that perhaps need to be taken into account when we do engage them, educate them and so on. Um, and and the, the the starting point of, you know, a young black person in inner city London may be very different from some young white kid in the home counties or whatever. I, I mean, so it's not that, that there is no kind of barriers or, or, or injustices, right? I don't know. Absolutely. There, there are. So what are you going to do about it? Like that, that's the thing you have to think. Well, what are you going to do about it? Are you going to wallow in despair? Or are you going to work really hard, be in a super strict school, make, you know, right next door, our kids are taking their maths GCSE exam right now. You know, how are they going to do well in that maths GCSE? By saying, woe is me, life is so difficult? Or are they going to pick themselves up and they're going to do what they can do to make the best of their lives? You've only got the cards that you're dealt. So mm -hmm. like I say, I mean, I, I'm very much aware of the fact that there is racism, that there are, there that, that that my children have all kinds of obstacles in front of them that the boys at Eaton do not have. Of course, that's the case. That's why I have a school in the inner city working with them in order to help them change their lives. I could have gone to work in the private sector. I don't because I don't, you know, I, I want to give my life to these sorts of children. Um, but but what, what, where does, I suppose I'm interested in, in where practically maybe, th because I have heard criticism from some on the right of programs, for instance, for encouraging young inner city especially black kids to go to cambridge or oxford and and special kind of um things being put in place to encourage that and facilitate that um in a way that maybe someone who gets similar or or even better marks from say a private school eton whatever maybe the the young black person from a less privileged background is going to be uh, uh you know preferred over that person so what is is that kind of a kind of situation where you think no that's woke that's sort of you know that that's kind of pandering to people's sort of you know victimhood and so on or is that okay is that actually about giving people a step up because they're starting from a di very different starting point okay so what you said there was ambiguous there are two different things that you could possibly be talking about mm -hmm. could be talking about um special preparation courses to help them uh, achieve the standard uh you could be helping you could be talking about money that they're being given in order to make sure that they can access courses or uh, any kind of support that they might have to reach the standard that's required to get into Cambridge. Um, I'm 100%. I mean, that's what we do. That, that, that's what I'm all about. I'm all about getting them to the required standard. Or you could be talking about saying, okay, Cambridge, if it's a black kid, you bring your standards down to here. If it's a white kid, have your standards here and let them in accordingly. Um, now, I have a problem with that. And the reason I have a problem with that is that expecting less of ethnic minority children and never insisting that they meet the various standards means that they'll never know as much. They will never be as skilled. And when they get out into the job, you know, into the workforce, uh, they will end up failing. 
And so it makes us feel better about ourselves when we let them into a particular university, but we don't see what then happens to them later. Do they drop out of the university? Do they end up, what, what happens with their lives? It's really important that children be skilled and given knowledge so that they can make something of their lives and find a good place for themselves. You know, I don't, you know, it, it, most people don't go to Oxford and Cambridge and they're okay, right? Like it, it, the, you don't need to get everybody to Oxford and Cambridge. If the child has worked hard and got himself the skills and the standard that's required, then great, let him in. Now you might say, but that's not fair because for some children that's easier. Yeah, well, that's true. Life is not fair. I mean, that, that's the way that it is. And you know what? For those, my kids, I, we do have kids that go to Oxford and Cambridge and they will have had to do uh, more stuff, been more exceptional than the kid at, at Eton, for instance. Yes, that's true. Um, and that's, that's just the, the way the, the dice rolls. I mean, I, I don't think, I, I don't think I, I would have been, it would have been good for me to have said to them, poor you, you're from the inner city, so don't worry, we won't teach you anything. But what we'll do is we'll fix the quotas at Cambridge and we'll get you in through the back door. And I know you're going to struggle with the degree and you won't be able to do it <laughs> because we haven't taught you anything. But at the end of the day, it makes me feel better because I've got you in like that. And when you say criticisms from the right, I don't think I've ever seen criticisms from the right uh, on the idea of supporting people and helping them get to that standard. In fact, there are loads of people on the right who are very supportive of what we do, which is exactly that. Right. <laughs> Um, it, 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 uh, but I don't know why anybody would want to argue to keep ethnic minority children stupid. I mean, I just didn't, why would you want that? Mm. You have, I think, so I've done a, I really yesterday did a lot of homework, tried to get to sort of know your voice by watching so many interviews and things and, and reading your voice as well. And, and, um, what struck me more than anything else was the stubborn hopefulness that you have with your high expectations and the the yeah I don't know how I would weird it actually but just that that unrelenting faith that you have um for your students and how would you is that something you see as missing then you know you've sort of alluded to that maybe it is is that something that's missing sort of across the board on state schools this like stubborn hopefulness and this absolutely high expectations because they can get there do you see a lack of that look there are lots of teachers like me out there um and head teachers too who are battling or trying or doing everything they can um and people who are not teachers don't realize just how much teachers have to give and yeah how exhausting it is and how much energy it is it requires and how intellectually demanding it is. I think it's the mo it's the biggest privilege to be a teacher and it's also the hardest job. You know, and people who haven't done it, they just don't realize. They don't realize how clever you have to be and how skilled you have to be at, at spinning so many plates. And because we have a society that thinks, and this is partly what I was saying in the speech, we have a society that thinks, well, if you can't, you teach. You know, teachers are just a bunch of idiots. Mm -hmm. um, I think I just think they've got that deeply wrong. Um, I don't think that there is much difference. You say state schools. I don't think that there is much difference between state and private schools. I mean, it's one of the points again I was making in the um, in in my speech. People assume that these private schools are so much better. That's not true. Uh, they've got different intakes. Um, if you've got an intake of families who are all paying a whole load of money for the child to be there, they are naturally on average, going to be much more interested in their child's education because they're having to spend 20,000 pounds or 30,000 pounds for it. Um, so, uh, and they're not having to deal with with the, the children who, you know, have very serious issues, who would be, who are in various different state schools, uh, who come from very challenging backgrounds. And because of that, bring all kinds of challenging behavior and challenging issues into the school. Um, so, and they just don't have to deal with that. And frankly, that 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 is a huge part of what a state school is doing. Mm -hmm. So, what I and that was the thing I was trying to explain to them at the in the speech. This isn't about schools. This is about society, right? We are where we are in schools because society has moved. So, like people are saying to me, oh, "There's no such thing as woke," and you know, of course, we don't care about identity. Yeah, you do. Don't you remember five years ago? We didn't use to talk about identity in the way that we do now. Things are totally different. I mean, one of my teachers went to a history um, 
conference, uh, you know, about t t teaching history. And he was saying how there was so much on uh, deconstructing whiteness, removing whiteness from history and so on. He said five years ago, they would never have been talking about that sort of thing. Think the curriculum has changed, which is why we see different sorts of books in the libraries. I mean, uh, I have a book here, an anti-racism book that we bought a bunch of books from one of the booksellers that gives books for schools. And there were a whole bunch of free anti-racism books in there. So to deny that this is going on, I mean, it's just mad. Now, you might want to say, you think it's good, which is fine. There are some people who will say, well, we, we think that the curriculum was really bad before. It was really racist. And we're pleased that it has changed in the way that it has. We want to deconstruct whiteness. We want to take whiteness out of the history curriculum. Fine, argue that. that. That at least is honest. What I can't bear is the dishonesty of doing all of that and then saying that this is not happening when it clearly is. Mm. I was going to ask a question that you might be, you might shout at me for asking, but you you say, you, you sort of touched on it right at the end there, but why is that? Why is you get an anti-racism literature? Why is that a bad thing? Well, that's a good question. So, I mean, John McWhorter explains it really well here. Um, I would say that anti-racism is really racist. Um, right. And, uh, and that anti-racism makes people, white people, feel better about their guilt, but that in actual fact, they're just being more racist than they ever were. I want to return to a time, 2019, when we're not talking about this stuff all the time because I think we're less racist then. And I think my children were better off then than they are now. And that's what I'm arguing for. Now, you can disagree with me and we can get into a discussion about well, what is anti-racism doing, which you might you, you might be asking me that. So what is it doing? I think it's divisive. I think it makes um, people see everything through the lens of identity. That's what it is to be woke. You look at me and you see a black woman. You don't see me. So it's really interesting. Since all of these changes in the last 10 years, maybe eight years, maybe uh, people ask me, you know, really love it if you could join our board. Um because we need we need to be more diverse. So you, you'd make a great contribution. And I always think, do you not see anything I've achieved? Do you not value my intelligence, my uh, capabilities, the things I've done? No. All you do is you see a black woman and you think, we'll ask her to be on our board because she ticks a box for us. That didn't used to happen to me. It happens now. I experience more racism now than I used to experience. Now, I say used to experience. That's in 2009. In the 1980s, of course, loads, you know, you're called every name under the sun. Uh, life is hard in the 1980s for an ethnic minority. But what I'm saying is things got much better and then they got worse again. So we are actually on a, in a downward spiral with all of this woke stuff and anti-racism stuff, which I think is making people more racist. And they're unable to judge me as a human being. They only see me as a black woman. It's a really interesting perspective, um, Catherine. I suppose bringing it back to the sort of spiritual dimension that we've touched on, something that I've sort of wondered as well is the fact that we are seeing, as it's well documented, you know, mental health issues among young people, anxiety rates, depression and so on. A lot of people have linked that to social media, technology and, and all the other kind of things of the modern world. I sometimes wonder if it is also an identity issue because we do live in a world, I think, where young people are kind of having to almost construct their identity from scratch. And there's lots of different options on the table and being told to see themselves through these these different identitarian views, as you say. And I, I almost wonder, coming back to the Christian story, whether it's the fact we've lost that sort of overarching idea of you were created by God. You have inherent value because of that. You were created for a purpose. And, uh, and 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 all that that kind of brings into someone's life, whether as we as you say, in a kind of more secular view of of life, where you are just another sort of floating entity, if you like, um, whether that's partly why we're seeing this kind of sense of who am I, what am I here for, how do I make sense of life? I, I mean, do you agree with that thesis? That's my kind of perspective on this. What what do you make of that? Yeah, Christians often say that to me. Um... Yeah, I mean, I, I don't really have an argument against that. Uh, I, I, yeah, I mean, the thing about religion is that it does give you a sense of purpose and belonging and knowing where you fit in in the world. Uh, and as I said in my speech, belonging really matters. 
So because I'm not religious, belonging to one's country really matters. Belonging to one's community, to one's family, to one's school and so on really matters. Um, uh, and it matters because as human beings, we want to belong. And I would argue that um, one of the reasons why people jump on the bandwagon of anti-racism is that they want to belong somewhere. And they know, oh, well, this will make me into a good person so I can be anti-racist. And they haven't really thought through the implications of it, but they know that there's a bunch of people there who they can fit in with and then they belong to that. And I, you know, what John Water is asking people to do in that book is he's just saying, look, look at the stuff that's going on. Does this sit well with you? Just be a critical thinker for a moment and think, is this right? Um, or is it racist, you know? So, no, I can't disagree with you. I mean, and if you really push me on it, you might then say, well, then why aren't you a Christian? Look, you know, maybe one day when I retire, I'll have time to think about these things. Right now, I'm just thinking about getting <laughs> into <your> Mass GCSE. <laughs> <laughs> I, I i guess yeah uh, obviously um but for many people it has provided that kind of foundation um you you i suppose my only concern is that if you do then maybe put your identity in something like you know your your british patriotism or something like that you know are you just swapping one form of identity marker for another that that can have its own kind of exclusivity you know you know at the sharp end of that you can get a kind of xenophobic kind of nationalism um i suppose is it just about keeping these things you know in the place where they should be yeah so you need a balance so obviously when i'm saying to when i'm talking to the children um about you know belonging to our country and you know it's funny because we sing, we used to sing God Save the Queen, now we sing God Save the King. Now, I have to say, it's not I'm not the biggest fan of Charles, you know? I'm not. Uh, I was a great fan of the Queen. Uh, but we sing God Save the King still um, because it's not about him as a person. It's about the institution, and it's about the royal family representing the country. That's what's happening there. It's not because I love Charles. Um, and so when we sing God Save the King, or when we're talking about the royal family or the coronation, for instance, we had our little bunting up you know and little cakes with blue and white and red and all that kind of stuff you know when we were doing that it's about making all of our kids our ethnic minority inner city kids feel like they belong to their country i don't feel that there's a risk of them turning into rabid nationalists marching up and down the street and shouting at french people i mean i, I that's not gonna happen you know all we're trying to do is have them love their country and to see themselves as part of that country so that they are, we are all integrated, so that we feel that we can all get on with each other. A multicultural, a multi-faith, multi-race society cannot succeed unless we're all under the same umbrella. We have to all be able to share something in common. And what we share in common is our country. Um, now, you're saying you could all share in common um, uh, Christianity, but that's not the case because we've got a variety of faiths in the country. So I don't think we can come under the umbrella of Christianity. We have to come under the umbrella of Britain. I mean, if you have another option, well, fine, I'll go with that. <laughs> but I can only think of our country being that that option. And that doesn't mean that we turn into Hitler. Like my kids are doing their maths GCSE. They're going to they're going to some colleges. They're coming to sixth form. They'll Some of them will go to university. They're not turning into Hitler. You know, they're all, there are a variety of kids from a background of different faiths and different races, and they're lovely, and they're all friends with each other across those races and faiths. And that's what we should be aiming for, rather than thinking to ourselves, we must never be proud of our country. Because um, if we can't be proud of who we are, then who are we? The point is, we should be something. We, 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 otherwise, we don't have anything in common. Otherwise, what happens is we splinter into tribes, and then each tribe is vying for their rights. I want my rights over your rights. And my thing is more important than your thing. Mm -hmm. And you see it. You see the children eh, 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 sometimes in schools fighting with each other across faiths, across races, um, not just in schools, but outside of school, in the streets and so on. The thing is, I think a lot of people, you know, they live very middle class lives. Uh, they live in Hampstead or wherever it is they are. They have no idea what's actually going on in the streets. They just don't know. I know. I've lived my whole life in the inner city. I've worked my whole life in the inner city. And I see what happens if you don't have an umbrella that encompasses everybody, where everyone can share together and feel that they're one together. 
and where they put others before themselves. You know, they're not just buying for what they want and for their own desires and for their own people. These are my people and these are your people. I make that I make that joke in the in the um in the speech where, you know, one of my Irish teachers says to me, Catherine, how can we be singing God Save the Queen? Do you know what they did to my people? And I say to her, Do you know what they did to my people? Because the point is it's not your people and my people. Uh, it's we're all together in this. So what if you're of Irish descent? So what if I'm of Caribbean descent? We're both British. We belong here in this country together, and we love our country and our school and our community, and 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 we put that before our own desires. That is my my belief that you know that is how you succeed in a multicultural society. Mm. So um. We should, although I really don't want to, I suppose for the sake of your uh, peoples, we should begin to wrap up. And so uh, we're called the Reenchanting Podcast. And so is that then, you've in a way already answered this question, but is that how you would um, encourage the reenchanting of the school system, the reenchanting of um, of education? Is, is belonging one major thing? And are there other things that you would like to see sort of good ideas that sort of, trickle out oh uh, well there's so many i mean the key thing that i'm always trying to get schools to do is behavior you know just be mm. more strict not be okay. strictness not think that it means that you're a bad person or that you're mean that actually it means you love the children and you love them enough to keep your standards high um i'm always trying to get them to understand just how much children can do and how much they can learn and what's possible so you know visitors are always very welcome at michaela and we get hundreds of visitors every year who come and look at the classrooms and go, wow. So I just, I'm just trying to show people what's possible mm-hmm. and what you can do with disadvantaged kids. You know, it's not the case that we should just give up on them or that the only solution is to fix the quotas at the end so that we can push them into jobs and into universities where they might find it difficult to cope because they haven't been taught the skills and the knowledge that they require in order to make a success of their life. The way to fix this is not to just change the quotas at the end. The way to fix this is before to give them the knowledge and the skills that they need to make a successful life. And what is sad is that we're not doing that. And then we're arguing to fix the quotas. It's just the wrong way around. Been a fascinating conversation. Thank you so much, Catherine, for giving us some of your time in what is, I'm sure, another busy school day for you. Um, It's been great to hear about your vision for re-enchanting education. And thanks so much for being with us on today's show. Thank you for having me.